actually be reversed for rearward flight. But the propeller system could still generate enough thrust to allow for rapid transitions into forward flight and climb out without nosing over, just like the compounded XH-51. Over the course of several months, hundreds of flight tests and military demonstrations were conducted in an attempt to gradually expand the Cheyenne's flight envelope. Like earlier compounds, the AH-56 could basically be described as an aircraft with an extremely effective lifting device. At higher speeds, support from the stub wings allowed the pilot to virtually excuse the main rotor from its lifting role so that he could attain much higher speeds. Within a few months, Lockheed's pilots had pushed the Cheyenne to speeds in excess of 230 miles per hour. The pusher prop emerged as one of the Cheyenne's greatest assets. Since blade pitch could be reversed, it could be used not only to propel the aircraft to high speed, but to slow it down as well. This same capability also allowed the pilot to actually put energy back into the main rotor system if the engine happened to cut out while in forward flight. He could then auto-rotate to the ground or even climb to a safer auto-rotation altitude with little difficulty at all. Several technical problems did emerge during flight testing, however such as a lack of stability both at low altitudes and high speeds. But most of these initial problems were systematically addressed and ultimately resolved. As the flight program continued, Lockheed engineers conducted extensive testing on the Cheyenne's potent arsenal of weapons. The program represented the first time in history that a helicopter had been developed with a fully integrated weapon system. Dozens of new subsystems had to be developed to monitor, aim, feed and fire the weapons, which included a 40mm grenade launcher, a 30mm cannon, a minigun, rockets and eventually even wire-guided tow anti-tank missiles. Conducting extensive ground tests to measure the effects of weapons firing, a fully integrated model was prepared for in-flight firing. The Cheyenne's weapon system was extraordinarily sophisticated for the time. The platform could carry up to 8,000 pounds of ordnance, which typically included 2,000 rounds for the 30mm gun, 780 rounds for the 40mm grenade launcher, up to 114 2.75-inch rockets and six tow missiles. The guns and the tow missiles were controlled by a co-pilot gunner who sat in a turret that could swivel through 360 degrees. The gunner's turret incorporated a stabilized lower sight head that contained a tracker for tow missiles, a 12-power optical sight, a laser rangefinder, and an infrared night vision sight. An early helmet sighting system also allowed the pilot to control the guns by simply moving his head with the target. The fire control system was fully automated. All the gunner had to do was place the reticle of his optical sight on the target and activate the laser rangefinder. From that moment on, the sight remained locked on to the target, regardless of aircraft maneuvers. A central computer combined sight line and range information from the swiveling gunner station with speed and attitude data from two inertial gyros and a Doppler radar system. The computer then calculated all weapons corrections and aimed the guns for maximum accuracy, taking into consideration winds at altitude and the ballistics of the weapons selected.
an onboard auxiliary power unit allowed the aircraft to stand by indefinitely with all systems up so the crew could scramble at a moment's notice from even the most austere sites. The Cheyenne was designed to serve in remote locations without ground support equipment so that it could respond immediately to the often desperate needs of commanders in the field. An advanced navigation system allowed the pilot to rapidly reach new destinations with great ease. The coordinates of multiple targets could be entered into the self-contained system at any time. The pilot was then able to quickly reference the real-time range and bearing of any of the targets with the push of a button. In August of 1968, Lockheed pilots conducted the first of many in-flight firing tests. Initial runs were made with a 7.62 mm minigun to measure the accuracy of the automated fire control system. The crews repeatedly struck multiple targets with incredible precision, even at a distance of more than 750 meters with offset angles of up to 70 degrees. Other weapons, such as the 40 mm grenade launcher, were soon installed and tested extensively with the same phenomenal results. Officials, both at Lockheed and in the Army, were extremely impressed by early in-flight demonstrations. The Army became so confident in the system's overall potential that it authorized production of 375 Cheyennes under a total procurement package that ultimately would have generated more than 3,300 aircraft. But a major problem soon arose during efforts to expand the Cheyenne's flight envelope even further. On March the 12th, 1969, tragedy struck when one of the 10 prototypes went down off the coast of California, killing the pilot. The accident occurred during a flight to investigate a variation in rotor thrust that sometimes occurred at high speeds. The phenomenon, known as the half P hop, caused the pilot's arm to operate the collective lever to an ever increasing amplitude. The uncontrollable action, commonly known as pilot induced oscillation, continued until the rotor blades came crashing down through the Cheyenne's tail boom and canopy roof. Significant problems and even major accidents are often encountered during the development of a new aircraft, especially with an aircraft as revolutionary as the Cheyenne. But this crash triggered a response that marked the beginning of the end, not only for the Cheyenne program, but for Lockheed's entire rotary wing effort. Within a month, Lockheed officials received a cure notice from the Department of Defense requiring them to fix a variety of existing and even anticipated problems with the aircraft. The company was given 15 days to prepare a response, which they did in a frantic attempt to save the program. But the answering document was not enough. Less than three months after the accident and only six months before the first aircraft was to be delivered, the production contract for the Lockheed Cheyenne was officially cancelled. While the production phase of the Cheyenne program had been terminated, development efforts continued under an army contract of reduced scope. A blue ribbon panel of government and industry specialists was appointed to monitor the remaining program. And in July of 1969, flight trials were resumed to test several modifications. 
Many observers claimed that the tragic accident had been caused by the Cheyenne's rigid rotor, which they maintained was inherently unstable. But subsequent testing revealed that it was the control system and gyro stabilizer, not the rotor, that caused the half P hop at high speeds. As a result, the gyro was eventually moved from the top of the rotor to below the transmission. It was also made smaller, lighter, and faster turning and was provided with a feedback path to detect blade root bending. This advanced mechanical control system was put through an extensive flight test program both by Lockheed and the Army. A separate electronic control system was also designed just in case the mechanical modifications failed to correct the problem. By the end of 1970, flight tests had been completed to everyone's satisfaction. The Cheyenne performed incredibly throughout the tests. High-speed maneuvers had included pull-ups to 2.6 Gs and push-overs to minus 0.2 Gs. Absolutely phenomenal for a helicopter. The system had also reached a top speed of nearly 250 miles per hour in level flight and more than 277 in a dive. Extensive in-flight firing tests were also conducted at the Army's Yuma Proving Grounds in Arizona to evaluate the full potential of the Cheyenne's weapon systems. The level of accuracy proved to be absolutely phenomenal. The first shot from the 30mm cannon consistently hit a 10-inch bullseye at a range of two miles. A typical demonstration featured the crew's ability to strike multiple targets during a single firing run. Here, the gunner strikes a primary target with 30mm rounds, while the pilot provides suppressive fire with the 40mm grenade launcher. Even as the pilot's rounds continued to hit with devastating precision, the gunner was able to launch a third strike against a mock convoy with a massive barrage of rockets. Other demonstrations featured the potency of the tow anti-tank missile when used in conjunction with the combined automatic navigation and fire control system. In this sequence, the gunner acquires a tank a few miles out. With a push of a button, the tank's coordinates are locked into the system, allowing the pilot to freely maneuver into a better firing position several miles up a narrow valley. As the crew drops behind a hillside, the Cheyenne